welcome everyone to today's event with Cecily Brown and Courtney J. Martin. I am Evan, the manager at 192 Books, and I'm thrilled to be presenting this event today with Fiden Press, uh, Paul Cooper Gallery, and 192 Books. Um, we are having this conversation on the occasion of Cecily Brown's show here at the Paul Cooper Gallery, which has been extended through December 12th. Um, really thrilled also to be celebrating this new monograph from Biden Press, uh, the first major monograph from Biden Books. Cecily and Courtney are going to discuss Cecily's work and then take questions from the audience. So if you have a question, you can send it via email to evan at 192books.com. The email is right there below. And the earlier you ask a question, the better chance it'll get answered during the program. So uh, ask now if you'd like, um, or if you just have any thoughts during the conversation. Um, if you don't already know, Cecily Brown is a renowned painter whose uh, work is in the public collections of the Guggenheim, Whitney, MoMA, and the Brooklyn Museum here in New York, as well as the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, the Tate Gallery in London, as well as many other museums across the world. And Courtney J. Martin is the director of the Yale Center for British Art, the former deputy director of the Dia Art Foundation and chief curator there, and the recipient of an Andy Warhol Foundation Art Writers Grant. Um, so with all that being said, I'm gonna hand it over to Courtney and I hope everyone enjoys. Thank you, Evan. Cecily, why don't we start here? Hi. Hi. So um, this is a big year for you. A lot of really exciting things have happened. Um, I got to know you last year um, in preparation uh, for this book. Um, Let's talk about it a little bit. Did you, this is your first major monograph, I understand. Um, mm -hmm. How did it come about? Could you excuse me one second? Sure. I realize I don't have a copy of the book right here. Oh. Um, so then I can look at it and yeah, here, thank you. Um, yes, and it, it's been just so lovely getting to know you. I was thinking when we got off the phone the other day, um, you know, what a pleasure it's been. And um, I do so appreciate that, you know, this, this could happen and um, you made it all pretty painless. Um, when we spoke the other day, I was telling you how I don't actually love doing interviews, but um, you know, we really, I think we covered such a lot of ground, um, including some things that have never really been talked about before. Yeah. So we got on well. And I, you know, it's funny because um, I don't think we'd ever really met properly before. You know, I think maybe like seeing each other in passing, but um, you know, I connect your uh, first years in New York so much with my own because I saw those first few shows at Deitch. And, um, you know, so getting to talk to you about them felt like going back, uh, you know, like re-meeting somebody from the past. Mm -hmm. It was nice. Yeah. So um, the book has just come out. In fact, it's coming out this month. And um, I do an interview with you in the book. Jason Rose Rosenfeld writes um, a major kind of art historical text. And then Francine Prose, the amazing novelist, uh, writes this beautiful kind of, uh, you know, study of you and, and your practice. Um, how did we all come together? Um, well, I mean, you know, it's a, it's not unlike other things I've done. It's not a museum catalog or a gallery catalog. So, um, Fiden, of course, had, you know, there were lots of many conversations about how the book should look, and you know, there's the standard format that they do in this series. Um, so we knew that there'd be these three sections to the book, and um, gosh. It all seems so long ago, <laughs> so much has happened. How a did it come about? Yeah. Um, I mean, I know Paula Cooper was the first person to bring your name up, for example, because um, I was having conversations with Paula and Steve Henry about, you know, what would be interesting. Um, Jason um, had interviewed me for the Brooklyn Rail a couple of years ago, I've done a feature, um, and I knew he had a lot to say about the work. Um, Francine was a kind of, you know, um, sort of just spark of inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, I love her writing and, um, and yours. And then with you, the British connection seemed really interesting to me. The fact that, um, you know, so few people know anything or care about British art. <laughs> Particularly um, British people. <laughs> 
including me, you know, often. I mean, you compare the Brits to the French and Italians and Spaniards, and you can see why British art gets so little attention. But of course, um, you and I had a lot of common ground um, with those few British artists that I have looked at a lot and worked from, like Hogarth or, um, you know, more recently, the Victorian fairy paintings. But I think your area of expertise um, made it make sense to, to have you involved. Um, yeah, I think it's it's challenging because you sort of want it to um, be the ultimate uh, book so far, telling that, you know, what story are you going to choose to tell at this moment? Because, um, yeah, it's been a busy sort of 25 years. Um, and I have been in a lucky enough position to have quite a few gallery catalogues. Um, so, you know, how, how do we want to make this different um, and make a sort of, wonderful object that people wanted to keep around. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a group effort, wasn't it? It was, I think you're absolutely right. I think what's also interesting is that, um, you know, the, the book has this great sweep to it in that, you know, you go back to some of your earlier paintings in the nineties um, where I think, you know, this is really, uh, you know, your entrance into uh, New York's art world in some ways, but it's also, We've gotten, we talked about this a lot that um, what it was like to enter New York in the mid, early mid nineties and what painting feels like now, you know, those places are worlds apart. Yeah. And so returning in the process of putting together the book, returning to some of this earlier work, um, how did you reflect on that difference between the distance, I would say, between the two? Um, I mean, I think I'm at a point where I'm looking back myself at a lot of early work that's been happening naturally over the last couple of years. I hope it's not, you know, running out of ideas, but more that one's own work becomes a source where I might have always looked outward at other people's work. You know, now my own kind of becomes something I draw from just as much. Um, so, I mean, one interesting thing is how, you know, there are the obvious things that you feel you have to include, um, you know, so 30 years later, well, don't want to age myself too much. What is it, 22 years later, yeah. I suppose. Um, you know, what are the things that still resonate with me? And for example, this pajama game, I've gone back to this image, you know, over the years, maybe three or four times in different bodies of work. Um, as you know, there are other images from imagery, other imagery from the beginning that recur and that I've returned to many times. So in a way it just seemed, um, you know, it's, it's, to be able to, as I said, tell the story, you know, pick which images actually really were moving one somewhere rather than, you know, I paint a lot. So there are plenty of paintings that I might, that I stand by, but they don't necessarily move the story along. So I think it was, um, it, for me, was a really good moment to do it just in terms of this sort of looking back. And I think I told you about this sort of mini retrospective. I paint, started painting for myself yeah. starting about three years ago. Um, when I had the show at the Louisiana um, I wanted to include monotypes um, and because I've always made monotypes and other prints from the very beginning um, we realized pretty quickly it was going to be almost impossible to find all these early monotypes but I have all of them in my head so I thought well why not sort of make a, a whole new room full of monotypes but take their subject from the last 25 years sort of go back and then it was sort of so invigorating and exciting to do partly because you know, there was a freedom because in a way that, because the subject was already decided, um, you know, there was a sort of carelessness I think I had about it of going back to things I knew really well, but um, approaching them, you know, with all, with hindsight really, um, with painting hindsight. Mm -hmm. um, so again, you sort of get to the core of what really interests you. Um, and then through doing these, I, I sort of rediscovered certain subjects. There were some that I thought, oh, you know, that, you know, maybe tried to make one print and sort of got bored immediately and others that I thought, wow, this is still really fertile material as a subject and visually, and there's still stuff I want to explore. Um, and then I went ahead and started making small paintings the same way. And so a lot of these early subjects I've been very deliberately tackling again in the last three or four years. So in that way, it was really good timing, I think. Mm. Um, but there's also that sort of sadness because I feel like I wish I could make this painting now, 
Um, you know, some of the early ones that I really like better than anything I've done since. And, um, you know, you sort of wish you could recapture that youthful verve. And it's really the sense of, I remember this painting so well. It's really the sense that I'm doing something for the first time that you never get back, of course. Um, so, I mean, it was the first time I was painting larger and I think I could afford good paint, as you mentioned, um, I think. Do we mention that in the interview? Perhaps not, no. I don't I think we talked. Um, about, I think we talked about it. The thing that 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 I found remarkable um, was that you, you know, this is one of the the sort of, sort of first public times that you're using photography. Mm -hmm. I think that's the piece that was was really striking for me, and the way in which, um, you know, you're using a photograph, um, and that photograph, I think, if you see it, it becomes quite visible in this painting. But at the same time, um, you know, this painting seems to distill. Um, a good amount of what I would think of as a kind of vocabulary that does seem to inform your practice for, you know, many years afterwards and not necessarily in a linear way. So it's not like by 2000, you're doing this and 2002, it's that, right. it, you know, sometimes there's a glimpse of, the, of something that is referent there in 2013. Um, Absolutely. And then you might find it elsewhere in 2009, but they, they aren't necessarily connected, but they do reoccur. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. This is, um, I, still, I still hold this as one of my favorites. And um, I, in fact, I like it even more now that we've talked about it a lot because, mm -hmm. so when I first saw this, I, I know who I was. I was, you know, very new to New York at the moment at which I saw this painting. And I thought that you had made this very dark, dark play on Doris Day, who was the star <laughs> of, the, of the 1957 film, uh, Pajama Game. Yep. And I thought, wow, that is it. I mean, you know, you have to be someone to really push Doris Day to that other side. <laughs> um, I was, I was, I was highly impressed. Um, and so, when we talked about it, and that was totally not your intention at all. Right, exactly. <laughs> it was more exciting, actually. Yeah, I just um, brazenly used the titles, and I was thinking of the musical, like more like um, you know Broadway musicals rather than the movies with a lot of these titles. But there is a very distinct blonde head in the middle. I don't have a little arrow thingy, but there's a red head and a sort of upside down blonde, that kind of flash of pale yellow. Um, and the blonde is actually something that's recurred a lot. I feel like someone could write a thesis on the blonde in my work. And I don't think that's an obvious thing, but you know, that's one of the comforts of getting older is these things that, you know, pop up and that you reuse. And um, I mean, I, I feel like that could just sound like you are running out of ideas, but I think it's, you know, it's a, it just makes so much sense to, you know, self-examine and analyze and look back at things and see what you were doing. And um, I can, as you say, this sort of um, vocabulary that I'm figuring out for the first time here, but say with the pale yellow, I mean, it's a story of color as much as anything and the way that you can sort of read the painting by reading, say, just the light yellows. I feel like that's something that I've continued to do a lot. Um, maybe more consciously over time. I think that there is also, um, what was so clear, I think, to so many people looking at, at this work from, uh, from that period is that um, you just weren't scared of color. Mm. And that sounds so simple to say now, but I think there's this moment, um, you know, where, where there is a feeling that to be restrained around color um, is somehow mature or yeah. is, you know, is, is reflective of, of a kind of painter's maturity, um, but yet you don't, you let go with it. And I think that there is, uh, it is very clear that you've come into your own, I think at just that moment with the, the absolute avalanche of the kind of color that you see. Did, it, did this feel like a lot of color when you were painting it, this whole group of paintings? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, when I first got to New York, I, I didn't paint in color at all. Um, I had sort of cut out anything that I felt was too maybe pleasure filled or self indulgent and color was one of the things that I sort of dropped and as you say you know one wanted to be serious and um, um, I'd, I'd shied away from color for a long time um, on my first few, year, first few years out of art school um, and I gradually got back into it by doing animation I'm realizing, you know, I had did commercial animation and then started making my own film. And it was through using a lot of color, making a film that I realized it was ridiculous that I had sort of not allowed myself to use it at all. 
Um, so yeah, this was this was probably the most colorful of all of that period because mostly I started doing this thing of painting the, uh, I've never liked the white canvas. Mm -hmm. So I've started trying to paint the, the ground one color before I started. So in that show at Deitch, the pajama game, you know, is obviously this deep cadmium red. And then there were others that had started bright yellow, bright blue, bright green. This is the one, I don't remember how High Society started. Um, we've talked about this painting a lot because, yeah. and I was always so thrilled that you saw the same, you know, this painting for me was always one of the key paintings. Um, and I feel like I'm still wrestling with the forms that are present here, you know, especially this whole sort of tumbling form on the left mm -hmm. that to me is both, you know, an enormous profile and also, you know, the figures of, uh, of women mostly, um, but trying to play on the double image. Um, I think this is the beginning of me trying to, I mean, I didn't know it yet, but working towards that sort of ambiguity where something can be read two ways at once or many ways at once. But it's very much starting with that, the idea of um, those sort of optical illusions where you can read, read something two ways at once. Um, but, you know, moving towards my, um, you know, what I basically spent the rest of my life doing is, you know, working on that tightrope of having things be recognizable, but at the same time sort of disintegrating or um, forming and reforming as you look at them. Do you, th do you think that comes out of having had such strong influences um, nationally, like, you know, coming from the UK, having gone to the Slade, um, you know, figuration and painting at the time in which you're being educated, you know, people still took figuration very seriously. Um, do you feel like moving away from that, that wanting a kind of uh, sense of doubling was a way of making sure that you were still involved in figuration, but you were expanding it? Or, it, or is it not related to figuration at all? Um, I mean, figuration was deeply unfashionable in England when I was in art school. I mean, there were people, it was acceptable to look at David Sally or Eric Fischel and people like that, or maybe Susan Rothenberg. But, um, but, you know, English figuration was way out. And I think I felt that it couldn't really be relevant. I couldn't find a way to use the figure that felt new or interesting. Um, so I suppose I naturally started breaking down the figure, but I'd always been very influenced by say, uh, Basilet's 60s paintings of the fractured figures. I've always felt this desire and need to paint a figure, but at the same time, just as much of the impossibility of doing it um, today. I mean, it seems, I mean, young painters don't seem to have a problem with it at all today, but um, it's almost hard to explain how, how wrong it seemed and how sort of over it seemed to paint the figure. Um, but, I mean, they very naturally sort of became more abstract, I think. Um, this was the, um, this painting was the painting that I frequently used when I taught um, to try to get uh, my students, both art history students and art students to see a grid without immediately attaching it to minimalism. Because it was, it's very difficult, actually. I think people, you know, particularly people of a certain age, that um, perhaps the idea of a grid and the idea of a grid coming out of modernism is so attached to a certain kind of formalism that I wanted them to see um, the grid as a form of organization mm -hmm. um, and to understand it differently. And so I would often use uh, this painting because, I mean, it, you know, it's very easy to do when you set up this kind of quadrant um, in this painting that you see replicated in, in other parts of your work. Um, but it was also interesting to see the responses to it because often it was a it was a real revelation. People saw the color first, and then had to work through the painting to actually see its structure. But then once they saw the structure, they could not see it. Mm -hmm. so very cool kind of doubling in that sense as well. I think one one of the things that influenced me the most when I was at art school was um, the National Gallery in London were doing these series the series called The Artist's Eye. And I remember Bridget Riley did one when I was first at art school and um, she analyzed the Titian uh, Bacchus and Ariadne, which was always one of my favorites. And I, I just remember it was this revelation because she sort of drew a triangle across the a line through the middle to show that it was just two triangles basically. 
and the way she broke it down. I feel like the blue in this um, is really referencing that blue from Bacchus and Ariadne and that idea of sort of building a painting in this very mathematical way. Um, even though my when I paint, it's pretty free, but that there are, I think there's always been a lot more control than people think in terms of trying to structure the picture. Mm. Um, well, that's a big leap. <laughs> it is a bit, you know, it's funny. It is a huge leap. Um, and yet the thing that connected uh, these for me was the blue shows up again here. Mm -hmm. It's smaller, but there, those little pools of blue really do um, stay resonant uh, throughout your practice. Um, talk about, explain where this comes from, um, just as a, as a painting, because it is, you know, it's fairly recent. Yeah, it's, um, um, as I'm sure some of you know, it's um, based on an album cover by Jimi Hendrix. And the cover's not by Jimi Hendrix. There was an album cover photographed by David Montgomery of, um, of uh, these women who, I guess one was to assume they were groupies, but a room full of naked women, or not even a room, they were on a black ground and they're all facing the viewer. Um, and I'd always found this image really compelling as a teenager. Um, and um, it actually came about because White Columns, Matthew Higgs asked me to, he was doing a show, some sort of benefit, um, where you, he wanted artists to pick an album cover to riff on, the kind of thing I normally run a mile from. But because this image had always been in my head, I said, yeah, I'll do it. Because I'd always related this in my head to like Ang uh, bathers and, um, you know, pictures of harems and things. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, this is like a, a really, um, you know, contemporary way to deal with something like a harem. Because I've always, often I've been drawn to subjects from old masters, but you just think, well, I can't do bathers because bathers don't really exist today. So like, who are these naked people in a glade? Like, it's just not something you'd see. So I think I leapt on these women in a way as how to paint a crowd of nudes. Um, but in a way, it's a bit like with the titles, it's slightly shirking responsibility by using a, an existing image um, to sort of get started. But I, what I did was go to uh, Two Palms where I make prints and played with this Ladyland image. I sent off for the album cover, for the album. Um, and something very funny happened because um, I'd been printing out images from the internet of the Ladyland as soon as I started working from it to play with and draw. And um, then I'd sent off for the album. And when it arrived in the mail, the photo on the album was taken about two minutes or 30 seconds after the ones I'd been drawing from. Cause I think there was a promotional shot that was out in the world and then the album itself. And it was this really uncanny moment when I unwrapped it cause it looked like they'd all just moved slightly. And I really loved that quality, you know, in a way that just, you know that's kind of what I try and do. Like what would something look now, but then again now like things that constantly shifting. Um, so I used that, I ended up making this enormous photo collage using, you know, both versions of the picture and doubling it and, you know, cutting bits out. And I figured it would just be this one-off thing. Um, but it ended, when I finished the collage and I came back to the studio, I just couldn't get the image out of my head and began making many drawings of it. And then finally paintings too. Um, and just got really uh, involved in these paintings for the next couple of years. And at first um, I struggled with them because they were the first things I'd made for years that were based on a, on a photograph. <clears throat> and in a way they came together too quickly at the beginning. But, um, and this is what often happens with me if I try and do a clearly figurative image, I feel like it just, it's too resolved too soon. And then it's kind of like, well, what do I do now? I mean, so I, I started making like three or four of them um, and then I had to, I paused for about six months. I just didn't know what to do with them because they were so, they were still too photographic, but I was kind of seduced by that because they looked so different from everything else I'd been doing. So I think what came before this was probably one of the most abstract moments um, for the few years before this. So I really was, I wanted to get hold of the figure again um, and to get hold of many figures, um, but I sort of struggled with how to proceed um, and eventually went back into them. And it was, there was one in particular that was very photographic looking and I, it was just figuring out a way to sort of fuck it up. Um, and I started sort of, it started looking like it was melting. And I realized, you know, that was the clue of how to go on with the others. Um, but honestly, I could still be painting this now. It's still, <laughs> I had to sort of force myself to change the subject after a couple of years. Yeah. Um, 
But then the women end up haunting nearly all the paintings ever since, because in a way, this way that they're this ready-made crowd. So if I want, you know, the suggestion of other figures, you know, I drew and painted them so many times that they're almost, they come out without me even thinking about it. Um, Have you ever used a live model? Um, not for many years. I did all the time when I was young. I did in school. Um, I did life drawing every day for a few years. Oh. Okay, we didn't I talk. I probably should. I always think I should again, but it's just the practicalities of it. And I think I'd be, um, I mean, Francis Bacon said it, it'd be inhibited by having the model there, I think. Mm -hmm. Their personality and having to yeah. deal with their breaks and do they wear a robe or, you know, do you make them, I don't know. It's just another human. I think it would be sort of obtrusive probably. I think if impressionism as a as a concept teaches us anything that um, the model will emerge as a subject, whether you want her to or not. Mm -hmm. and, that, you know, that, and that's a hard thing to do with that. You're right. There is another presence that's there. I mean, I started working from photographs, you know, in the around the mid 90s. I mean, I, I drew from photographs all the time. So, you know, with a lot of the early erotic work, I, I copied porn and erotica. Um, just to kind of figure out how the bodies would go. You know, they're actually quite cold drawings. I think some of the, you know, they're really just getting the information. And that's probably where I started the thing of always copying other, from outside of, you know, not making up drawings, but almost always copying from another source as a way of just getting that information so that when I came to paint, I sort of had it in my muscle memory. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the size and scale of, of this work. Um, you know, it is large in, in scale in some ways, but then in other ways, it's, you know, it's uh, this, the kind of orientation of it as it almost feels like a freeze, you know, there's an architectural kind of feel to this. How did you, how did you get here? Um, well, I'd done uh, multi-panel and especially diptychs and triptychs for years. Um, and it had actually started because I didn't have enough space to do large works in a previous studio. So putting two, three panels together was just a way around that to work bigger because I've always liked working large. Um, um, but in all the other cases up until this one, I'd, I'd have two, three or more panels, canvases, and I wouldn't ever decide which order they were going to go in. I would just start and part of the fun or the process would be, you know, taking away, remove, being able to remove half a painting and just work on the other half, you know, putting them back to front, putting them, you know, that way of keeping things very open um, for as long as possible and often not deciding till very near the end um, in which order they'd go. But this one was so big. Um, and for once I had quite a clear idea in mind <laughs> um, before I started, not super clear, but I decided at the very beginning, the left will be the left and the right will be the right and nothing's moving. So this is their order from the very beginning. And I think it was, I felt like it would be too unwieldy if I didn't do that. Um, not just the physical thing of moving it around, but I just needed to make that decision very early on. Um, Cause this was the biggest thing I'd done at the time. Um, yeah. And I'd just been to LA and uh, I have a child and um, we'd been spent time at the La Brea Tar Pits, oh, wow. La Brea. You know, I mean, I mentioned her because I'm, I think I might not have known about it otherwise because I'd been to LA plenty of times before I had a kid, but now we always go to La Brea and it's this wonderful museum. Um, um, and there are those tar pits and reconstructions of tar pits. We went to the little display, you know, they have a put on a show for kids. Um, and when I left, I couldn't stop thinking about these tar pits. The way they taught, taught it to the children was the most um, compelling because they had these um, sort of x-rays of the earth as the as the animals would have sunk down in the tar pits through many centuries. And it's just these extraordinary images I came back with. So the whole panel on the left, I was thinking about tar pits a lot. I actually thought I was gonna go on to do a year of tar pit paintings, but this ended up kind of being the only one. So the, I, I, and at the same time I had started looking at um, Delacroix um, shipwrecks mm -hmm. and was um, beginning to get very involved in the shipwreck as a subject. So I was thinking of the middle as this kind of shipwreck, the left as these sort of tar pits of these animals being dragged into the uh, center of the earth. 
And on the right was kind of post Ladyland um, sirens, you know, sort of mythical. The great thing about working on this scale is it's, um, it's like having an enormous stage. I mean, I think it's very unfashionable to talk about a painting as a stage, but really I think on this scale it is like that where in the whole thing is so physical, it does become a sort of performance. Your body is very involved. You have to be very energetic and active and up and down ladders. And, you know, um, it's like, you have to be physically very present. Um, so wait, is the, do you mean that the stage is the construction of the painting on a large scale or is the stage the viewer's reaction to seeing this thing unfold in front of them? No, the stage is the canvas. Um, okay. I was thinking more, or maybe more like a dance. Um, okay. I was talking to a choreographer friend um, last week about it, how, you know, I always think it must be so different if you're a dancer and you rehearse in a smaller space, you know, for months and months and months and you're all aware of where each other are in the room and then suddenly you have to do it in a theater and everything feels sort of different around you. I think just that sort of, what I was trying to say at the beginning was, just this sense of having more space to move around in that you physically and literally have, can get away with more in a way that you can do something over here that only mildly has to relate to something over there. Just that the stage for me is so much bigger as well to like move through space. Um, I did start feeling sort of like a dancer with this scale, which is great because I'm completely have two left feet. Um, but you know, the sense of bodies moving through space, I feel like it's very much the trace of a body. I mean, I think that's partly what works about this scale is this, it's huge, but something about this trace of the, my size and scale remains, I hope that makes it feel also on a human scale and not, you know, you, cause you want it to feel intimate even though it's so huge. And then yeah. Paula was clever enough cause I used to always hang paintings high but insisting on hanging it low. So it was really this very immersive thing um, where you really, when you were up close to it, you were really immersed. Yeah. Um, but it's become more and more challenging to paint small for me. Um, and in fact, the current, in the current show, the, the smallest ones were by far the most difficult paintings for me. Um, so I, I've always tried to change the scale a lot and keep myself on my toes, but in a way this is the most satisfying and engaging. Yeah. So, the biggest revelation huh. in all of the conversations that we had in the last year, the biggest revelation for me um, was your connection to Maggie Hambling. And I'd read about it. Um, and even the first time that we talked about it, you sort of mentioned it, but I had, I had never thought about it visually and tried to put together what it would have been like um, to have seen that work. So, um, you know, she gave you studio space as when you were a student, right before you went to the Slade, um, and, I, and, and I think this is right, that you basically put together your portfolio in the studio space that she loaned to you um, right. so that you could get into the Slade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we talk about this in our interview um, that, yeah, well, I was failing to get into art school at the time. It was like 85, I guess, 85, 86. Um, I couldn't get into to school. So, um, I enrolled in Maggie's life drawing classes at this sort of adult education place. And I loved her work. And the one on the left was um, super important to me because probably the first thing of hers that I saw, um, I think she, she had a show on at the Serpentine around the time that we met or that we, I started going to her class. Um, and looking at it again, you know, cause I remember I was in love with this painting. I had, a, I had the invitation from the Serpentine on my little board for years. Um, and I think what it was, was because I knew I loved old master painting so much, but I saw very little of it in contemporary work. And so it was always sort of the struggle to me. I saw old painting as fresh and new and alive, but I felt like, you know, I sort of conflicted about having this relationship to it and didn't see any evidence in contemporary art that there had ever been old painting. And Maggie was someone who I felt um, brought, you know, painting of flesh, for example, which was my obsession, brought the painting of flesh and even a mythical subject into, not today exactly, but a very lively painting that, um, a kind of like the Anywheresville of it as well, which I think also drew me to the Electric Ladyland, this sort of not one worrying about where he is or, you know, that he's obviously a creature in a painting in an artificial space, but um, so, 
looking at it again, I can think of many ways that I think it, I, um, it influenced me at the time. Mm. Um, the meat, you know, the, the sort of more gentle bacon, Francis Bacon in a way, more, um, you know, the direct um, exchange with the viewer of the Minotaur and how, you know, empathetic one feels towards him. Um, He's a lost the flesh was painted. I remember, you know, she was a huge influence on me when, so she actually lent me her little garage to work in. She moved her cars out and, and um, so I was working in her garage for a year and um, I had all these fan brushes like she did and, you know, lots of Indian yellow, just like Maggie. And, um, and um, I remember the way the, the way the chest is painted is very beautiful. And I completely remember just trying to emulate that. Um, and she was a wonderful teacher. So with drawing, I mean, she was absolutely the biggest influence on me. Um, and she was such a hard worker that, you know, the, her, her, the way she lived was incredibly important and big, big of influence on me. Mm. Um, and I was also her cleaner because that's what I used to do cleaning jobs at the time. Um, and I used to look after her cats when she went away. So the, the painting on the right hung in her house. So I would always see it when I was looking after the cats or doing the cleaning. Um, and again, I was just madly in love with this painting. I was about 18. Um, I still love it. Um, it's very early. I think she was probably about 18 when she did it. Yeah. So she was, she was a big role model and a heroine. And we're still friends, of course. Yeah. And she has a show up at Marlborough in London right now. Great. She does. Yeah. Um, for those of us who are coming to us from London. Yeah. So you've got a show in the UK as well. Yes. Um, this is Blenheim Palace, uh, finished in the sort of English Baroque style by 1722. Um, for people who are seeing this for the first time, I just want to make clear how important uh, your show is in this space. So, you know, Blenheim is um, an English heritage country house. It is one of the largest. It is probably um, extremely well known from having been, you know, depicted in film, but also being a, a tourist site, major collection of old master paintings, fantastic Reynolds and Anthony Van Dyke works are there. Um, it is the ancestral home of the Spencer Churchills, uh, where the Duke of Marlborough uh, has a seat. It is also uh, the birthplace of Winston Churchill. But the big deal, I think, um, for you, Cecily, right now is you are the first contemporary artist to make site-specific work um, for an exhibition in the palace. I'm not sure. I think some okay. of the others may have made site-specific. I'm the first painter okay. and the first Brit. Um, I think some of them did make site-specific work. Okay. Maybe Lawrence Wiener and uh, Barbara Kruger. It's actually, technically the difference is that you're inside and it's an exhibition and you're a painter. I think th you're right. Those yeah. are the qualifiers. And I think with the paintings, because I'm a painter, I'm the first person to sort of remove a painting and put something else, you know, whereas Lawrence, we, you know, people did their thing because they were mostly sculptures or sculptors or conceptual artists. Their work was in the space, but not maybe integrated so much in the same way because um, just the nature of their materials. And I must say, when I was first invited to do it, I thought, oh, I wish I was a sculptor because sculpture would be what would look great here. And I was actually planning to do a mini show within a show um, um, and invite four or five other artists to do a piece. Other sculptors, like invite did. sculptors. And, and sound, um, but it, it, was, it couldn't come together in time. Wow. The main person I wanted couldn't do it, so I ended up abandoning the idea. Yeah. Um, but yeah, cause I, you know, I've always been reluctant to show paintings with, with older, uh, with older paintings. Um, but I ended up, you know, being, thinking it, it worked out pretty well. What's, what's that reluctance about? Is it a fear of yeah. the two not meshing? Like what, what is that? I think it's a fear of not measuring up really simply, you know, that, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the painting just would look kind of crappy next to something that's really good, you know. Hmm. How did you approach this project? Um, 
So I knew as soon as they asked me to do it, I kind of, it all kind of came to me at once um, that I absolutely wanted to do it because I had sort of paintings I wanted to make that I felt um, would be perfect, which would be um, hunting scenes um, and battle scenes. And um, I mean, maybe it wasn't as immediate, but as I think I went to visit and um, first of all, they've got toy soldiers everywhere, like little battle scenes and reenactments and little models. And, you know, the whole place is obsessed with war um, and Churchill, of course. And, you know, I could, I just thought, I think battles actually came before Hunt. So I thought, okay, I want to do battle paintings. Um, but when I was there, I took tons of pictures and, um, you know, just really thought about it and started watching little YouTube videos on the on Blenheim and um, all these ideas started coming together pretty quickly. Um, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember in what order it all happened about sort of starting to do the hunt. Um, Can we talk a little bit about the hunt? Because yeah. I'm, I'm really fascinated by how you get to this painting, um, which is seen here um, just behind the bronze. So you, de you describe it as being the hunt after Franz Snyder's. Um, and this depicts, you know, I think in many ways, uh, the sort of the unique feeling, the sort of expression of a hunt, the kind of the tearing through of, of these animals, you know, in pursuit of each other. Seemingly there are no humans um, in the space. Right, mm -hmm. um, and the Snyder uh, in question is uh, Franz Snyder, 17th century painter um, that you would have been familiar with from perhaps going to Kensington Palace to see the painting that's there. That's the larger version of the one seen here of the boar hunt. Was that uh, why this painting, at relative to uh, to Blenheim, what you were thinking about at that moment? How do you get there with this painting? Um, I mean, I think a number of things just kind of congealed. Firstly, I got a dog a couple of years ago and um, spending time in the dog runs in New York, you know, I've spent a lot of time looking, watching the dogs play um, and fight. And, you know, I'll end up asking people, can I take a picture of your dog? I'm the weirdo. <laughs> with the, um, and often I really love those kind of very muscular dogs, this kind of dog. Um, so I'd been thinking about dogs in art, dogs, painting dogs, drawing dogs. I mean, I'd had animals off and on in my work for years and I always sort of want to have more animals in my work, I don't know. Um, I I'm sorry to be so vague because I do feel like a few things happened at once because another thing, and by the way, there are so many variations on the Snyder's painting. I sent you this one because there are just dozens of them, yeah. um, which made them really perfect to work from because I'd be working from several different Snyder's at once. Um, so except for in this case, um, which it's actually not this one, but it's a very close one. Sorry about that. Um, um, and this is one of the only paintings I've done ever where I drew the drew it first in charcoal, um, which in a way makes it more of a sort of big colored drawing. Um, I just never do that. And, I'd, and um, I just thought, well, why not just copy it very directly? Mm -hmm. I always just paint into it. I never draw first. Um, except for the form in the front, I guess, which is more, <laughs> you know, just free form. But, um, and in, in fact, I think what makes it work. And in the bottom right, the little spaniel, he's almost skeletal in that one, but that spaniel ends up, is in almost every painting that I did um, at Blenheim. He's the Blenheim spaniel, in fact. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it was like when I stumbled upon shipwrecks as a subject, it was just one of those things where I was like, how can I never have painted the hunt before? Okay, I just remembered Delacroix, the big Delacroix show at the Met. Okay. And so I love the tiger hunt. I've always loved his hunts. And um, I love the Delacroix show. And I think I just really had, how do you do a hunt in the back of my mind? And maybe over the years I copied one or two, but it just never went anywhere. And then it just, you know, I started, reading about Blenheim and I was looking up, is fox hunting still legal in England and all these things? And um, it is, it's not, but they still do it. Um, but I just really thought um, to have this brutal tradition that's still allowed um, on the walls of the palace would be a really, um, you know, salient. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
you know, but it's a lot to just to do is with the shipwrecks as well. It's that thing of um, finding a subject that sort of ticks all your boxes. Um, that there's movement, there's conflict, there's many colors, there's something dramatic, you know, sort of tragic. Um, but they were also very handsome, you know. Very nice. um, and then it always struck me how the dogs themselves are never really getting hurt. And now I've moved on to still lives. There's often a live dog in them, even though, you know, all these other animals are the carcasses and being used as meat. Um, but the dog is always somehow, you know, a, a cut above, which got me thinking to how the class system, you know, even applies to animals. Mm -hmm. And actually it even applies within the dog world that there would have been, you know, you can think of Hogarth in something like this, the sort of posh little whippet or spaniel next to the kind of mongrel. Um, but the, it just, the, it just um, ticked so many boxes for me. Um, and it's, as with the lady land and shipwrecks, I didn't necessarily know it was gonna become a subject that engaged me for the next two, three years, but I started making lots of drawings of them and I just became completely entrenched. And then the other thing was, um, I started looking into the history of Blenheim's collection um, and what paintings they had once owned that they no longer owned because they once had like one of the best collections in England, um, which they really unfortunately don't now because a lot of the major paintings were sold off by some dissolute Duke. Um, and I managed to get hold of the catalog online of everything that had been sold off. So there was one moment when I thought, wouldn't it be fun to paint a miniature or a version of every painting that they used to own and hang it here actually in the long library but there, again, there wasn't time, but the funny and lovely serendipitous thing was they had actually owned one of the Snyder's hunts. Wow. Um, so I was already very entrenched in the subject and then discovered that they, they'd, um, a Snyder's hunt had actually lived there, which isn't at all surprising. I mean, probably every big house had one, but I like that idea of putting something back in the house. Yeah. Um, but also something, you know, I really, wanted to speak to the sort of violence inherent in the history of a place like this. Yeah. You know, today I realized this morning that today would have been, or tomorrow rather, would be uh, Snyder's 441st birthday. Oh, wow. So even more strange connections with Snyder. I wanted to, uh, you know, this painting in parts was in the studio when we first started talking and um, I've never seen it all together. And it was exciting to see the image of it, but I wanted just to show a quick, uh, uh oh, there we go. I wanted just to show an image of, of, of it for scale um, so that people understood how large these were um, and incredible and yet so detailed. And this, this feeling of intimacy, I think is absolutely there even at that size and scale. Well, you know, I still use brushes of all different sizes. I mean, I tend to start them off with rollers and brushes like the one you can see on the floor. Um, and, you know, then they do tend to, I sort of tend to get very close in. I mean, the trick is to keep going out again. So sometimes I have to be quite, um, um, you know, brutal and get a big roller, you know, even if something's become quite detailed, it just becomes too fussy and go back into it with the rollers and sort of edit. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was, you know, at first when I wanted to do a painting for that space, I kind of dismissed the idea when I realized I couldn't fit anything that large in my studio. But, you know, then the idea of just doing it in four parts. I mean, I've often worked in parts, so yeah. it wasn't that big a deal. Um, and it was, uh, I'd been seeing this fresco in Naples, in uh, Palermo a couple of years ago, and that had been on my mind a lot. Um, and it was actually divided, it's divided into four parts, which was really the very simple, dumb way I got to using that fresco as my four part. It was even, it was, it's the triumph of death, which I've been sort of, you know, the, the, the show was postponed because of the pandemic. So I said wow. to someone like, you know, I would, I would never have painted this like during the pandemic. I would never have done a painting called the triumph of death. Um, so I'm just grateful that it has the date 2019. Um, but the, the reason it's based on that fresco is really just the idea of something in four parts. Um, that's a kind of a coincidence. Yeah. 
So I think that we should go to questions now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to leave up the images um, so that we can just have a kind of brief run through the current show that you have at Paula Cooper. Yeah. Um, but we can take questions, I think, through the chat, if people have any. Okay, Jordan asks, could you expand on the difficulty you have with the smaller scale paintings? Do you welcome the challenge? Is it somewhat similar to painting again as your younger self with fewer resources? Um, no, it's not similar to painting as my younger self, but funnily enough, a lot of the subjects um, of this, these paintings, I kind of call them bedroom paintings as a group. And these were my sort of lockdown paintings. And so these were the ones that were the most difficult. I think it's the sort of medium sized scale that's really hard because, um, you know, actually at the same time I was working on smaller ones and slightly different scaled ones that weren't such a problem. Um, but the, the, actually the scale and subject are very similar to things I was doing at art school of a, a figure in a room in ecstasy, maybe alone, maybe not. Um, I think the hardest thing for these was, uh, again, it sounds really dumb, but it was just that they were interiors and they had a lot of straight lines and I've really never done <laughs> straight lines. I, my work's always got that sort of organic flowy feel and very rarely is there anything geometric. So I think that was just, um, you know, the main, the, the hardest thing about them, trying to paint these spaces. And then you've got the whole problem of where the figure is in the space and wanting to keep that um, sort of a degree of quote unquote abstraction while still sort of narrowing down that they are in a fairly specific space. Because I think in a way, most of my fleshy paintings are usually half flesh, half landscape, then they're usually outdoors. Um, so the feeling of being inside is quite foreign to me. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just, they are very sort of claustrophobic, which, um, you know, probably yeah. reflected the time. We've got a question from the Tracy Emin studio. Oh. She asked, firstly, a huge congratulations on the success of your recent exhibitions. Thank you, Tracy. Um, and the question here is, sorry, I just lost it. How many uh, paintings do you make in a week? In a week? <laughs> in a week. <laughs> I don't make any in a week. Um, what I do, I often start several at the same time. I know from my Instagram, it looks like I make like 20 a week, but other people, there'll be things that hang around for two or three years. So I never finish anything in a week. I might start, you know, depending on the scale, like with small ones, I might start up to 10. Um, but I really keep a lot of balls in the air at once, um, you know, and with the thing of changing scale, I've always really made a point of changing scale a lot. So I'll have small ones that are on the go. Often the small ones actually go on for much longer. I've got things that might be five years old that I then go back to. And partly that's just an ease of keeping them around. Um, but I would say the average, you know, the, the painting on the right there, the very colorful one is, uh, was started pre-COVID and probably worked on for about three months. Mm -hmm. And then I just worked on it for a, maybe a week or two in the summer. Um, the one on the left was actually quite fast. And that was funnily enough, the only one of the bedroom, that was sort of towards the end of doing all those bedroom paintings. And that one finally flowed. And I think it's the format is because it's long and skinny. I just, it just worked more. Maybe that, that's just a format that seems more natural to me. It's extraordinary how to me it changes, you know, um, how something flows much more easily. For example, there are two paintings in the big room. I don't know if you have a slide of them um, that are probably might, no, keep going. Yeah, on the left. Um, I think that scale comes most naturally to me. And that is about sort of my scale. It's sort of almost about as far as my arm can reach in any direction. And those actually were much faster, the two of that size than the, the three in the room next door, which are very congested. Um, so Tracy, um, very occasionally I might finish one in say two weeks, but more often than not, it's between three to six months, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, and then, but there are works and I, because I put things away and bring them back out, you know, there's always a lot of stuff going on. And I, I, it's very much part of a process for me to put things away for, you know, sometimes months, and not look at them. Do you think about them while they're away? 
like without oh, looking at them? Are they, are they kind of in your mind or in your dreams? No, sometimes they are. Yeah, I mean, I think it's all one big work really. So yeah, it's all kind of part of the same thing to me. Um, I mean, sometimes there'll be a moment where I'll say, wait, what are those two over there? And there'll be two things that maybe I just started, worked on for a couple of days and put away and I'd almost completely forgotten about. So, but there'll be, a, you know, along similar lines to other things that are going on. So it's all really like one big body of work. Micah asks, how do exhibition settings influence the way you work, the way you think about your work? Um, the Palace and the Paula Cooper Gallery are starkly different. Um, how does your works placement shift the way you view your own pieces? Um, well, until a couple of years ago, I'd only ever done works that I knew would end up in galleries, or not end up, hopefully, but, you know, pass through galleries and be in a white cube. So it was only really, um, you know, I did approach Blenheim differently. Um, but, I mean, the, the works in the studio, you know, while I was working on them, I didn't, I wasn't thinking, oh, well, this will have green velvet behind it, or this will be on a red wall. First of all, I just, I do what I always do, which is made work and then edited later. So some of them, it was a complete fluke that they fitted so well in the spots that they did, because I had a wide variety of sizes and shapes. Um, you know, so the actual placement wasn't planned when I began the works, but I actually, the one on the left didn't make it into the show. <laughs> It's come back to the studio actually, and I'm yeah. working on it. Um, sometimes, you know, that's an interesting thing. I got that to the gallery and it just didn't stand up. Sometimes it's so hard to see things in the studio. Um, it's actually two different, two panels and I was gonna put them together and now I'm not, I'm not sure, it's still in progress. Uh, the one on the right seems to be everyone's favorite because I see it posted so much and this was almost the most torturous of all. So that's always really gratifying. I have to say, when I was making these, I really wasn't sure if these were the worst paintings I'd maybe ever made. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. And I was, I'm actually really pleased I had that feeling that I can, because I just really didn't know at all if these were just like embarrassing. Um, I kept so telling, I kept point. telling Paula and Steve, like, it, they might be really terrible. I just, I'm really not sure. Um, and some of them probably were. So, I mean, I did end up having some of them come back. Um, and the, the best three ended up hanging. Um, but it's, it's really interesting to me to see how people react because, um, but in answer to the question, Mika, um, I always try not to, until, except for Blenheim and one other project, I've always tried not to think of where things are going and just try and paint very freely as if I'm a kid, you know, and know what, in, in my garage and Maggie's garage and that no one's gonna see them or care about them. I think that's the only way to, to go. And then, um, you know, it's a challenge to keep challenging yourself. Um, so you kind of have to not really think about the audience and not really think about how they'll be seen or thought of but in the in the end you know the studio looks more like a gallery than a palace so the way they look on a white wall I didn't change my approach to making them I think and all the subjects that I worked on for Blenheim were things that I feel like I, I could easily have worked on anyway like I've always wanted to do battles and I've always done landscapes and there were fairy paintings too at Blenheim and that's another subject that's kind of been lurking on the edges so um in other words I wouldn't have I wouldn't accept, I wouldn't want to do a show somewhere that didn't resonate where I really felt like the works could, you know, make sense. Well, I guess that's obvious. Claudia Getting talked asks, out. <laughs> Claudia asks, do you start a painting with a certain source and strictly stick to this source during the painting process or can there be a change to a different source after the start? Um, no, I change a lot. I mean, I often, I have a lot of things lying around on the floor. So usually when I paint, I'm not really looking at the source so much anymore. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'll draw a lot very directly from, from the source. But then the drawings are not um, studies for the paintings as such. They're really just that sort of getting in the information. Um, and I don't, I don't look at the drawings when I paint. So say with the hump paintings, I had like 10 different Snyders printed out or the, the ones at Paula's are still lives, are also Snyders. The big one is based on the Snyder's still life, um, which I came into very naturally after the hunt paintings. Um, 
you know, before and after the, um, but, um, sorry, I'm losing my thread. That's okay. I, you know what? I think actually we've talked a lot. Are Maybe, we done? But yeah, I think we're good. Yeah. This might be a good place to wrap up. Thank you so much, Cecily. This was wonderful. It's good to talk to you again, as always. Lovely to see you. And so, you know, I know how busy you are. So thank you so much for taking the time. No, a total um, pleasure for me. Thank you. And thank you, thank Evan. You. <laughs> thank you so much to Cecily Brown and Courtney Martin for that wonderful conversation. It's so great to just immerse yourself in, in sort of that conversation between two wonderfully intelligent people and just take a break during the day. Um, if you know people who can uh, watch during the middle of the day, we'll have a recording of this conversation posted shortly. So watch again or send it to your friends. Um, as a reminder, Cecily's show at the Paul Cooper Gallery has been extended until December 12th. And if you'd like to make an appointment to come see it, there is a link below on this page. You can also go to paulcoopergallery.com to make your appointment. Um, the catalog from Biden Books comes out November 18th. If you'd like to pre-order from 192 Books, you can send us an email or, or give us a call. Um, if you can't make it down to Chelsea uh, for any reason, you can also order the book through our bookshop.org page. Um, we're open every day from 11 to 5 until 6, uh, Fridays and Saturdays for socially distance browsing. So please come by and say hello whenever you can. Um, thank you again to Cecily Brown, Courtney Martin, and to everyone at Biden Books and Paul Cooper Gallery for this wonderful afternoon. And have a great rest of your day, everyone watching. Thank you.